So thank you very much, Randall, for the great introduction and already telling about coins. And thank you very much um, to whoever asked the last question to Professor Stern about does location matter? The answer is yes. It very much does. For the last 20 years, I have been studying how collaboration can lead to creative output. What you see here is um, the network of the first project I did when I left Deloitte and came back to MIT. And together with um, one of my key mentors at that time, Tom Allen, was studying the Boston Biotech Cluster. So what you see here is the um, network of biotechs, that's the black dots, together with the green dots, MIT, and this other little university down the river, and two other universities, and then the big pharmaceuticals. And as we have heard before, those are the key ingredients. Now the question is, why are the biotechs successful? And the answer first is location, location, location. So we measured success by looking at patent count. And what we found is if you are within a magic mile, it's not a magic mile, it's a magic five mile radius, then you communicate just so much more and you have so, much, so many more patents. But at the upper left quadrant, um, you see those other companies that have similarly productive patent output and that are far away. The reason? They are tightly connected by communication, if not by location, with MIT, of course. We, um, in that project that was in 2002 to 2004, the net internet wasn't as it was today. So we were sending people manual emails and asking them to report with whom they had spoken at 500 Boston biotech startups. And if you were far, far away, but you communicated daily intensively, then you were successful. And so the key is communication. And it's not just communication in general, but what I call entanglement. Now, what is entanglement? Professor Stern has mentioned he didn't call it that way, but it's really that thing here. Now, we don't have to sound. <laughs> And yet another one. So, what do they have in common besides the smiling faces? They are in sync. They are totally synchronized. And they are stealing ideas from each other, a lot of ideas from each other, and get stellar success. And that's what I call, we have three entangled teams. And what I have been finding in my research over the last 20 years, the more a sponsor is entangled with MIT research teams, the more they get out of the relationship and the more they are successful. And in the beginning, we measured that with email. That was my starting point when I left Deloitte, came back to the Center for Collective Intelligence. I was allowed to take my own email network and see whether entanglement, being connected, get, being part of those creative innovation networks was actually good for creativity and success. And so I will talk about how those coins work, how they are entangled, and then how we measure them. My background originally, I was a mathematician, and so I love to measure things. And so we developed all sorts of measurement tools, starting with email networks, looking at your smiling faces, which basically means in the age of AI, image recognition to see what emotions you have when you interact with researchers. 
We then also found that it matters to have people with similar morals in the same team. And I call those groups of people sharing similar values tribes, digital virtual tribes. And we even build tools that allow you to create your own virtual tribes and telling you how well you do, giving you a virtual mirror of your own communication behavior. That's the recipe to success. And the goal is creating coins not at MIT, sondern with MIT. Now, just to give you an example of a coin, and I have told that story many, many times. It's back to my postdoc days at the lab for computer science at MIT 30 years ago, when I was researching a tool called CyberMap, which was a little bit like the World Wide Web. It was ahead of the web. And so I had the chance to observe the creator of the web, Tim Berners-Lee, firsthand, how he succeeded against all obstacles with his crazy creative idea by recruiting other intrinsically motivated people as members of his coin or collaborative innovation network. He wanted to recruit me also, but I'm still ashamed. I thought that idea would never succeed. I had better things to do. So I was working on my own system, which went nowhere. Whereas Tim was a master of entanglement because he was so infectious in attracting others, other postdocs. Um, he came to our group and he got other postdocs smarter than me to work with him. Um, I left and went back to Switzerland, but he started the World Wide Web Consortium, which is sort of the bigger ecosystem, the learning network that spreads the ideas, that recruits the big sponsors around the world, the interest network, which um, develops other things like Mosaic browsers, which became Netscape, which is now um, Chrome, and so on. But this is the engine, and the World Wide Web Consortium, and the way how the web created, was created for me, that's the boilerplate poster coin. And if you look at MIT, there is now dozens, if not hundreds, of other coins, we can look at all areas and you will see whether it's energy, food, transportation, um, whether it's uh, virtual reality, whether it's um, personalized medicine, we have other teams and they create their own coins. And the question is, why do they succeed and why do some not succeed? And that's really, for me, the key. The answer for me is entanglement. What do I mean by entanglement? These are two entangled mice. They have been entangled artificially because they have both an implant in their brain which synchronizes the way how their brain pulsates. So they are totally synchronized. Just like the dancers in the TikTok video, the mice are even more synchronized. And you see how they love each other. They stick together. They are attracted to each other like a magnet. Now, obviously, we cannot implant, put an implant in your brain. We cannot put another implant into the MIT researcher and get them together. But there is other ways. And here you see an example of human entanglement. This is a teacher in a very poor school, in a school who is totally entangled with each student because he has a personalized meeting. So this teacher is humble enough to learn a personalized greeting for his students. He's totally immersed into his community. And he's a stellarly successful teacher. Those, although it's a very poor school, all of those kids went on to college and became very successful. So that's basically my vision. The question is, how can we get there? And my answer is measuring. I love to measure. And I also was brought up as the son of a beekeeper. 
So I get very much inspired by the bees and the way how they um, communicate with each other. And so I was trying to look at, here you see the waggle dance of the bee, which is attracting others. What is the waggle dance of Tim Berners-Lee? Bob Langer, and all of those other famous, highly successful researchers at MIT to attract others to start um, startups and to collaborate with big companies. And over the last, time is progressing, 20 years, we started by looking at email networks, Twitter networks, Facebook networks, face-to-face -face interaction networks by initially using sociometric patches that measure how we look into each other's eyes, but um, also Twitter networks, of course. We look at the dynamics of interaction and we look at the content and how we are starting to pick up and mirror each other's words. And obviously, people like um, Tim Berners-Lee, they are in the upper right quadrant, that means they are the bee queens, which are in the center of the communication network. They are highly responsive to each other, and they start mirroring and picking up each other's language. So this picture here is one of the key insights of our last 20 years of research, the seven honest signals of collaboration. It starts with structural properties, like you need central leaders, but you also need balanced contribution. And that was one of the key things of team that I observed. You have, can have imperial CEOs, and now I'm, I'm threading on thin, thin ice, you can also have imperial professors. And then the communication with their graduate students is very unbalanced. That's not good. What you want, and I think the example that Professor Stern gave regarding Disney is a bit like that. Although they were implanted here, it was not a well-balanced communication. It was just, I'm here, and now tell me. I want to be spoon-fed. I hate students that expect spoon-feeding. I want to have balanced contribution. That means you need to kick them occasionally, and then they will start to become creative on their own. But in the beginning, you need the Tim Berners-Lee and you need um, the Bob Langer that starts it. Second point, network dynamics. And that was another eye-opening experience when I was a postdoc in the group of Tim, that when, at that time, somebody got an email, they were sleeping over it, that was in 2000, and, um, no, that was 1993, um, you were, then waiting for five or six or seven days and answering it except Tim. Tim answered already in 1993, three minutes later, because he was so passionate. And others also were answering his emails very quickly because he had so much respect. Speed of response is both a proxy of passion and respect. And the other thing I already mentioned, rotating leadership, you don't want to have the imperial professor or the imperial CEO or the imperial R&D manager um, of a big company sitting here and just expecting to be um, served research results. You need to have very active exchange, rotating leadership. And then you also want to see the content. You want to have new, and you can measure that very well using AI and natural language processing, new words which are picked up by others. And the more you start to have a community that defines their own language and is using that and others start picking it up, the more creative it is. And then in the end you have this really, this ecosystem of coins that are all interacting with each other. This year is um, a movie of my own class, my coins course, which I have been teaching for 20 years. And what you can see here is how in the beginning you have, not the imperial CEO, but the teacher, Peter, but then other teams start forming and they 
interact very independently. So measuring networking structure and networking dynamics, that's one thing that we do based on all sorts of communication archives. But there is a second aspect to it, and that is emotions. Because if you have an imperial CEO and he gets into the meeting, if you are honest, you will not see smiling faces, you will see disgusted faces. And that can be very eye-opening, earth-shattering, frustrating, very hard. And um, you can also hide behind privacy rules. But in our research, we have built tools like those Wojcik's glasses. And then if I look at others, I will see what they really think about me. <laughs> because I see their emotions. So you see he did to hear, um, in one of our sponsor companies in Japan, and he looks sort of puzzled at me, um, not surprisingly, because I'm wearing those, wearing those weird glasses. But um, we have also done experiments in the course where we measure the emotions. We have also built another tool, which looks like a smartwatch, because it is a smartwatch. It's actually just an app running on Android Wear or iWatch that measures your happiness and other emotions based on your body movement. So the more I move my arms, the more excited my voice is because you have a microphone which is built in. And then there is other things, the weather forecast. 50% of my happiness is the weather forecast. And all of those things are put into a machine learning model and then I know that I'm really happy to be here because Randall and Carl invited me and I'm finally again with real people and not just little five faces in Zoom. And the happy meter is telling that. We have done an experiment in Germany where we have equipped um, the members of the innovation lab of a big German bank with a happy meter. 50% of the people got feedback about their happiness and the others were just wearing, wearing it as controls. And what you can see here is that the ones that were told that Randall and Carl made Peter happy or unhappy actually improved their happiness by 14%. And it was also other things like um, if you are really burned out, um, overworked, get very stressed out, then take a nap, drink a cup of tea, or go and take a walk. So we were giving recommendations based on, we were trying to analyze what sort of stress you were currently under. But the point is, having that virtual mirror that shows you your emotional state will actually make you happier. Now, we have done even crazier things, and we have been using plants as biosensors. That came out of frustration in Europe. You, have, you might have heard of GDPR, very strict privacy regulations. And then I said, what sensors do not have privacy? Plants. And so we started wiring up plants. This is a mimosa pudica. And here you see me um, walking by, pretending to be very exhausted and pretending to be very sad and uh, overworked. And we are reading the brain waves, the action potential of the mimosa. And as you can see here, it looks very different. That means you can basically put a plant in your office and then you will know the happiness of your employees or your visitors based on the way how they move their bodies because plants, mimosas are extremely sensitive. It's basically a, a super sensitive, much better than any hardware, computer hardware, super sensitive body sensor. Now we have also started, now I'm really converting my house into greenhouse. Um, this is the dancing plant, Codario calyx motorius, and if you look very closely, you see that there is little propeller leaves that are circling around. And it turns out they circle differently based on what they hear. So we tested them by um, playing classical music to them. And also, I'm Swiss, so I was taking yodeling as the other control. And as you can see, they, their leaves circle around very differently. So what we are trying here is that sometimes, for, in some environments, it's better to take the emotion through sound cues 
and trying to have, and there is some data sets that a lot of emotion researchers use, whether the leaves spiral in a different way when you hear sad voices compared to happy voices. But this is just an example of how we are measuring emotions. We are also measuring the morals, and I told you I'm inspired by these. So um, I try to have a very simple framework. What you want in your creative teams, busy bees, and even busier ants, what you don't want is the leeches that exploit a team that, um, and the imperial CEO might be a little bit like that because those people drain energy. So um, how can you measure that? Now it turns, and we also try to have ground truth. So we did some research where we got large groups of people to enter their moral values, and then we equipped them with our sensor, and we looked at their face movements to give them a feedback of what their moral values were. So the values, personality, um, morality, and risk-taking attitudes we got through surveys. And then in the end, we uh, built a system that will now tell you who you really are by just watching a series of shocking movies. So that means, based on your emotional response to Donald Trump giving a speech about the wall, to a little baby or to cute little dogs running around, will tell you whether you are a bee, an ant, or a leech. And we are not telling anybody. If you want to try it out, this is the system. And we have now applied that method to um, teams where they get feedback on who they are. And using that feedback and then getting teams together is um, one way of greatly increasing productivity. So what we um, created something called virtual tribes. This was all inspired by the last four years in the US where we basically have two alternative realities of people interacting with each other um, in words but sharing very different value systems. And we built a system which will find your tribes based on the words that you use. So this here is basically my own Twitter feed which will group and tell me whether I am an ant, a bee, a leech, a politician, journalist, and so on. And I compared it with somebody else who used to be an extremely active Twitterer until a year ago. So we got a lot of input um, from him also. And then we could calibrate our system and in the end measure your different tribes, whether you are a bee, an ant, or a leech. And this is some generally interesting insights that, for example, will tell you whether um, that bees are the happiest and leeches are the angriest and um, some, other, some other of those um, moral properties. But if you get all of this feedback, and that's the key insight, that will actually increase your personal happiness and the your team's productivity and increase the entanglement. So this here is another system that we built where we had, over the last 18 months, a lot of little talking heads, and we were constructing emotional roller coasters. And the more you get shocked along the way during the presentation, the better is the end result. That was the key insight that we found so in a presentation, you really want emotional roller coasters. You also build a system that will tell you who you are based on your email. So you get basically your turn taking based on who is speaking right now. Then we have no turns at all. But um, if the red ball, we basically tell who hijacks the discussion and the more balanced the team is, the more you get rotating leadership, the better. This year is another system that works the same way. This year is, will tell me 
based on the people I'm interacting with, who is part of my tribe, and then I will get similar tribe members, and now I'm coming to the last. So this allows me to build my dream team, and that will greatly increase productivity. I will conclude with a final slide from um, work that we did with a very big company, a sponsor of ours, with their R&D lab, where we got a lot of coins, where they are totally immersed with um, MIT researchers. It's part of the um, MIT Energy Initiative. And what we found out is that if researchers are really applying all of those things that they have been describing and are interacting um, and exchanging information very rapidly, the more entangled they are, the more individually successful the individual researcher and the teams are in the end. Thank you very much. What are some observations, effects of entanglement and interactions for virtual and hybrid teams? Um, I, I think that um, the more you are synchronized, the more responsive you are, the more entangled you are. So I think those um, the mice that were basically um, really sticking together like they were glued together, that was a very um, good metaphor also for your interaction with um, MIT um, researchers. If you are, have a long distance relationship, it doesn't work very well. So what you want is really close interaction. And so personally, I'm not a big fan of just sending three um, senior executives here and starting up a listening post. I ha have found over the last 20 years working with sponsors that if you have a group of researchers here that are actually interacting directly with research teams on campus, that's a much more productive way. And that's, for me, the close entanglement. And we have just one other question. How do you balance the enhancement of entanglement with the problems of, it says, non-diverse groupthink team blindness? Oh, that's a great question, because um, there is a big risk that you can have um, too much groupthink. And so, on the other hand, you can also have too much diversity. And then people don't speak the same language anymore. So in my view, it's, uh, there is a balance in the middle. And so, what you, to give you a concrete example, you want, in my own field, AI, NLP researchers from the company that talk with um, AI, NLP researchers um, on campus, and then we all speak the same language, but they might be from South Korea, or they might be from another country, and then you get this, I, you still have the diverse input, but it's mediated by having a shared language. We have one more question. I, we, Juan, do we have one more? Uh, here we go. Did your research team determine an optimum rotation time for rotating leadership? Is this leadership in te teams at the, uh, or at the highest level? Um, again, I think a great question. It ties into the previous one in that, in a sense, you cannot have enough rotation. And I'm at the center for collective intelligence. So we really would like to have a collectively entangled brain, like a synchronized mouse brain. And we cannot give us implants, although we are right now doing a lot of experiments with brainwave reading and trying to see how we can synchronize brains. Um, but I think the more entangled you are, the better. So the, the more intensive the interaction is, the better, which also means there is an optimum size for innovation teams, um, because you cannot entangle 100 people can entangle five people. So if you get those 
small groups of, and in my interaction with sponsors, I have really seen how well that works. If you have two, three people on the sponsor side and you have two, three people from our side and they work together on a similar project and that works perfectly. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you.